He fantasized he was a soldier of fortune, a trained assassin. He would tell me far-fetched tales about him being in the CIA, having worked for the government. Then she arrived in Daytona Beach. She hit the boardwalk like a pistolero. The combination of Costa and Deidre is like having fire and gasoline. And fantasy became reality. This appeared to be a great big pretend until the first bullet entered his body. Greek immigrant Konstantinos, or Costa Fotopoulos, joined Daytona Beach, Florida's elite when he married Lisa Paspalakis. For years, she and her family had run a number of businesses on the city's boardwalk and had been leaders in Daytona's small but influential Greek community. Costa Fotopoulos was well regarded until a night of violence in November 1989 led to a series of stunning revelations that Fotopoulos had long harbored deadly schemes and had managed to recruit a young woman from the fringes of Daytona society to help fulfill them. This is Deidre Hunt. She is serving life without parole for two murders and an attempted murder. In the fall of 1989, she was 20 years old, down and out, and stalking the boardwalk of Daytona Beach. The boardwalk was either about prostitution or drugs. It was day to day or minute to minute. Then she met 30-year-old Costa Fotopoulos, a man she quickly learned had an obsession with violence. His soldier of fortune and his take on all that stuff, it wasn't like going to play cops and robbers and then you come out of it and you're living in reality. That was his reality. But how willing was she to act on it herself and commit murder? That was just one of the questions law enforcement would have to face when they began piecing together a set of crimes so callous that seemingly every day there was a new stunning revelation. It was literally like walking through a real novel of a story, uh, maybe a grade B story, but it was still a story unfolding as you lived it. How does the story work? It basically starts off with the shooting in the house. November 4th, 1989. A phone call was made to 911 from a home on Halifax Avenue. It was 4.54 a.m. 911, what's the emergency? I'm the address was for the Paspalakis family mansion. Okay, you've heard, you heard they were gunshots? Yeah, they were right in front of the house. The caller was 25-year-old Dino Paspalakis. He lived there with his mother, his older sister Lisa, and her husband, Costa Fotopoulos. Is, is everybody okay with at that moment, Dino learned the gunshots had come from inside the house. Authorities arrived to a confusing scene. So we got two people shot. I got some screaming in there, so I can hear something. I don't know. Police secured the home, making a room-to-room -room sweep. In the bedroom, they found two gunshot victims. 29-year-old Lisa Fitopoulos had been shot once in the head while she was sleeping. She had miraculously survived and was rushed to the hospital.
Beside the bed was the dead body of an intruder. He appeared to have found himself on the losing end of a home invasion. Our initial observations were that a burglary had occurred, that uh, this individual had, uh, for some unknown reason, shot Lisa in the head. His name, police soon learned, was Brian Chase, a regular in the CD Society on Daytona's boardwalk. Police interviewed Lisa's husband, Costa Fotopoulos. He said he had been in bed with her at the time of the incident and that he had awoken after hearing a gunshot. He told police he had seen a shadowy figure in the room, grabbed his 9mm gun from under the bed, and opened fire. One bullet had hit the window. Five had struck and killed Chase. Fotopoulos' quick response, it seemed, had saved the day. In the first news account, he was commended for an astonishing feat of bravery. Costa was a hero at the very beginning. Uh, a handsome young fellow defending his wife against a, a attack, a midnight attack from a burglar. This fit well into what was already known about the 30-year-old Fotopoulos. He was a Greek immigrant who had married into the wealthy Paspalakis family four years earlier. He had a good reputation in Daytona Beach's political and social circles. Because of my roots in the community, uh, because of the fact I'm a public official, uh, I had spent time in, uh, uh, in uh, their home. I had been to parties where he was there. Yes, he was charming and, uh, what's that other word, debonair. Police, however, were already growing suspicious about Fotopoulos and the burglary. When you have time to start looking at the big picture, you have to start wondering in your mind if there's more to this than meets the eye. For one thing, valuables on the first floor had been left untouched. Also, the burglar's apparent point of entry, a broken window found on the upstairs porch, seemed too small. So the first question became, how did he get through that window without him being cut? It just didn't look like, from looking at the size of the window, that he could have squeezed through there. Then there was Costa Fotopoulos' heroic story. To investigator Chuck Evans, it defied common sense. It's just hard to believe that someone can be in a sound sleep, be startled awake, to automatically, reflexively reach for a firearm, to just indiscriminately shoot right away without even knowing who you're shooting. The investigator had spoken with Fotopoulos and found him oddly lacking in emotion. I don't remember his demeanor being that upset, and I know that he wanted to go to the hospital, but it, you know, it wasn't the frame of mind where, hey, I can't talk to you, I, 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 I got to get my wife, she's been shot, I got to get to the hospital. I don't recall that frame of mind. Police knew something wasn't right, and within a day, they were proved correct. Someone who regularly hung out on Daytona's boardwalk called 911 with a stunning claim. I got off the money to kill this lady. I got offered money to kill this lady. Her name is Lisa. That's all I know. They were going to pay me ten thousand dollars. At that point, the caller added a new person to the puzzle: a girl he knew that had been having an affair with Costa Fotopoulos. The caller's message was clear. Find Deidre Michelle Hunt. Within days, law enforcement would be talking with her, and she would give them far more than they were expecting. Not only about a plot to kill Fotopoulos' wife, but also details to a completely different murder. A murder where she pulled the trigger as Costa Fotopoulos held a camera. In 2003, at the Lowell Correctional Institution in Florida. Convicted killer Deidre Hunt spoke to American Justice about her role in a series of crimes in Daytona Beach, Florida, 15 years earlier. 
She wept through much of the interview and said repeatedly that she was not responsible for the crimes that took place. He had a lot of control over me that I didn't, I didn't even know about. She claimed that her alleged accomplice, Costa Fetopoulos, had abused, tortured, and bullied her to go along with his every plan. The only two choices was the two choices he gave me. Either he could kill me or I could do what he said. But this display stands in stark contrast to what she told authorities back in 1989. On November 7th of that year, acting on a tip from a 911 caller, authorities sat her down in the Daytona Beach Police Department. From the start, Assistant State Attorney David DeMore found Hunt almost disturbingly forthcoming. The 20-year-old immediately launched into an emotionless tale about a murder plot she had cooked up with Costa Fotopoulos to kill his wife, Lisa. She started to tell me about how the plan had begun and how money had been offered. And I was literally writing notes furiously. And all of a sudden, she said to me, she says, oh, by the way, we killed a boy out in the woods a couple of weeks ago. And I literally leaned back in my chair and I almost fell out of the chair. Because at this moment, I didn't know whether I was dealing with someone who was sane or insane. Damore stopped her and put her on camera for what would be one of the most unexpected interviews he had ever observed. A Daytona Beach detective, Greg Smith, conducted it. Well, it started uh, when you met a certain, a certain person. Hunt said Costa Fetopoulos was her boss at the pool hall he owned on the boardwalk. We just started like seeing each other. We went weight running and we went a few places and he bought me some clothes and we ended up sleeping together. The 20-year-old quickly moved from describing the affair she said she was having with the married Fetopoulos to allegations about him that were beyond belief. He was trained by the Israelis, the terrorist group. He was trained by them. He went through six months of severe training. He's been, he's been sitting underground with, with camouflage over him for four days without moving. He was talking about initiation into this stupid group, whatever he's in, the ancient case. And you know what that stands for? Yeah, hunter killer. According to Hunt's bizarre account, Costa Fetopoulos said he was a member of the Hunter Killer Club, a secret group of assassins with one requirement for entry, committing murder. The least amount of money he told me he killed somebody for was, was 3,000. The most amount of money he's gotten was 100,000. Was he killing you before? I'm, okay, he, one time I, I noticed he, his, a letter, and it had CIA on it. And I said, you're in the CIA. And he said, he said, no, I'm not. He goes, I work for them. They hire me to do jobs. These people will send him. Along with these strange allegations, however, she did repeat much of what the 911 caller had said about the murder attempt on Fotopoulos' wealthy wife. Hunt claimed it was Costa's plan and that she had willingly gone along with it. He said he wanted to kill his wife for the money. And, you know what I mean? I was like, whatever, you know. Hunt said it had been her job to convince a companion on the boardwalk, Ryan Chase, to commit the crime for $5,000. She then said what Costa's instructions had been. Her description contains some surprisingly accurate details about the plot and the layout of the house. So he said, kick the, you know, a window in and um, go in, go up the stairs, his bedroom's on the left, go in, his wife is on the other side of the bed, to go over, just put the gun to her head and shoot her three or four times. Back on the some of what Hunt said matched facts and evidence in the case, but the rest of her story seemed to undermine her credibility. 
Hunt's most outrageous claim was that several weeks earlier, she and Fotopoulos had killed an acquaintance from the boardwalk named Kevin Ramsey. She said it was her initiation into Fotopoulos' so-called hunter-killer club. Hunt claimed that they had convinced their victim it was actually his initiation. He was to go out to the woods with them and not flinch while she fired shots at his feet. Once there, though, Hunt said she killed him. I shot him. How many times did you shoot him? I shot him three times in the chest and once in the head. In the left hand temple, I shot him right here. At this moment, I have to be honest with you, I didn't believe her. I didn't believe that. Uh, it just, you know, a, as a boy shot out in the woods, nobody knows about it, nobody's reported him missing. Hunt also said that Costa Fotopoulos had videotaped the murder of Kevin Ramsey. And he walked to the left. He took out the video camera. And he pointed... It seems so far-fetched, it seemed so out of the ordinary. No, no one had ever heard at that moment of someone videotaping themselves murdering somebody. But one by one, these stunning allegations would find foundation in hard evidence. We asked her, would you go out there and help them find it? No hesitancy. Police drove her out there. Within moments, she led them to where the decomposed body of Mark Kevin Ramsey was found. Ramsey was ID'd as a 19-year-old drifter from North Carolina. He was tied still, still tied to the tree, literally slumped over, leaning forward. After the discovery of the body came the videotape. A search of the Paspalakis home yielded a high aid tape. It was taken to the state attorney's office. I'm going to guess 10, 12, maybe 15 men in the room. And we very carefully removed the tape out of its canister, put it into a machine, and turned it on, not knowing what we, we were going to see. As the tape begins, it's grainy, and all of a sudden you see a light on Deidre Hunt's face. Don't shine it. Don't shine it on my eyes. Shine it down. Hello. Don't do that. That it. Come close, I can see you. Hold on. Right there. Hi. Right. Okay. What comes next is too disturbing to show on television. With no hesitation, Hunt fired three shots into Kevin Ramsey's chest. She immediately walks up to him. She grabs his hair, pulls his head forward, takes the gun, puts it to his head, and blows his brains out. I wished I hadn't seen it. When I heard the boy cry out, I heard his screams, I'd never heard someone in that kind of pain. I knew that those men in that room, even though they were experienced police officers and they had seen probably every difficult situation you could, not a single person had ever seen someone being executed like that and literally heard them in the throes of death. The tape was the most damning piece of evidence any of these men had ever seen. Hunt is clear in the frame. She takes out the gun. You can see her fire. Clearly audible is the voice of an adult male. Come close, I can see you. Hold on. There. Police were certain it was the voice of Costa Fitopoulos. Charges were filed against Fitopoulos and Deidre Hunt for the murder of Kevin Ramsey the murder of home invader Brian Chase, and the attempted murder of Fotopoulos' wife, Lisa. 
Next, police went looking for why this had happened. What had inspired these two people to commit such gruesome crimes? Daytona Beach, Florida, November 1989. 30-year-old Costa Fotopoulos and his mistress, 20-year-old Deidre Hunt, were arrested and charged with the murder of two teenage boys and the attempted murder of Costa's wife. The city was transfixed by the case. The information came out slowly over weeks, but once it did come out, people were just stupefied by the, the magnitude of it. It was a disturbing portrait of two people from distinctly different backgrounds who authorities said together had driven each other to kill. The combination of Costa and Deidre is like having fire and gasoline just pouring one onto the other. They just fed off of each other. One came to Daytona Beach along an immigrant's path. Constantinos, or Costa Fotopoulos, was raised in Greece, moved to the U.S. to get a university degree, and was introduced to Lisa Paspalakis and her family through contacts in the Greek community. Costa was a lucky man. Lisa stood to inherit millions. She was pretty, she was intelligent. Uh, her future was assured. They married in October 1985. Together they seemed like a very good family. I mean, they was, there was never, I never heard one, one bad word come out of them. Tony Calderoni was Costa's business partner in his boardwalk pool hall and often saw Lisa, who was running her family's thriving boardwalk business. They were always just like, you know, holding hands and kissing and just like the normal little lovey birds would be, you know. At the time, Calderoni says he considered Costa a friend. Costa was a very, very capable, charming people. Everybody liked him. Everybody spoke highly of, of uh, Costa Petopoulos. But Calderoni says that Lisa and her family got more than they bargained for in the new son-in-law. As I got to know Costa a little better, he would tell me far-fetched tales about him being in the CIA, having worked for the government, uh, having been a, um, a counter-terrorist, a ninja. Uh, I call him a ninja idiot, but he was that he was a ninja. He was into the, the stuff of a 14-year-old boy's fantasy. He, he said he was a trained CIA assassin, an international counterfeiter, a weapons expert. One time when I walked in, there he is sitting at the bar and he's reading a guerrilla warfare comic book. And I said, Costa, why are you reading comic books? He said, these are not comic books. These are of the way the real life is. This is real life. Out there is the comic books pointing out towards the ocean and the beach. Okay, whatever. While Costa's business associate was dismissive, the runaway kids on the boardwalk were another story. Costa would hold court at the pool hall, spinning tales of his exploits. At one point, he told the kids that he worked for the CIA and showed them an envelope that had come from the agency. In fact, what had happened is he had written the CIA for a job, and they'd written him back, and what the contents of the envelope was, we have no interest in you. But, of course, the kids seeing an envelope from the CIA, he was a big shot, especially to kids who were living day to day, having to hustle for a livelihood out on the boardwalk. For years, the fantasies of Costa Fotopoulos were just that, fantasies. Then, in the summer of 1989, Deidre Hunt arrived on Daytona's boardwalk. Her background was very different than Costa's. She told American Justice she grew up poor and abused in Manchester, New Hampshire. There were sex issues from when I was a child for as long as I can remember. When I was seven, I was um, molested by a neighbor. And then I was also raped by him when I was 11. I told my mom and she called me a whore and stuff and the police were never contacted. Today, Deidre's mother confirms her daughter's story. When Deidre was a child, 
Carol Hunt had been diagnosed with a number of psychological afflictions, including multiple personality disorder. So one time I may have beaten her, and the next time I may be kissing her. She never knew when or what she would come home to. And as a child, Deirdre had no choice. I was her mother. Deirdre had, I think, a rougher upbringing. Early age, uh, drops out of school, starts running with a gang in Manchester. She came to Daytona Beach in 1989, hoping to make a fresh start. Daytona Beach is big enough. There's a lot, there's so many street kids that you can get lost in it. But Deidre did not get lost. She had charisma and good looks. Deidre hit the boardwalk like a pistolero. She got a job at uh, Top Shots, which was Costa Fotopoulos' pool hall and beer joint, and immediately charmed the crowd. She diddly bopped around that bar in a black bikini. She was bright, she was bubbly, she liked making money, and uh, she fit right into the dark side of the boardwalk and the cast of characters that were coming into that bar. Before long, she and her boss, 30-year-old Costa Fotopoulos, were having an affair. This is where the accounts of the authorities and Deidre Hunt diverge. According to the authorities, her confession to police is the best guide for what happened next. In it, Hunt said that when Fotopoulos regaled her with stories of his exploits in the Hunter Killer Club, she listened and responded. Costa was telling her that there was money to be made as being a paid assassin, and that he in fact had killed people in the past. I think Costa's fantasy world would have gone nowhere except for Deidre Hunt. I think she galvanized him. He wanted uh, killers, and she wanted a way off the street. Deidre Hunt seemed to almost be boasting about fulfilling his plans, about killing Kevin Ramsey. I shot him right here. And telling Brian Chase how to get into the house to murder Fotopoulos' wife. He said, go in. His wife is on the other side of the bed. Go over, just put the gun to her head, and shoot her. I'd never seen anything like that in my career, and I, and I don't think I'll ever see quite expressed that way. There was just, there was no remorse, there was no concern, there was no pain, there was no sorrow for the taking of this life. But Deidre Hunt, as we shall see, as a different version of her relationship with Costa Fotopoulos and why she participated in his plans. Throughout the spring and summer of 1990, Daytona Beach authorities were preparing to take 31-year-old Costa Fotopoulos and 21-year-old Deidre Hunt to trial. They were charged with a heinous series of crimes. One murder had been videotaped. Authorities thought that Fotopoulos and Hunt both deserved the death penalty. But Deidre Hunt told American Justice she deserved leniency. She claims her relationship with Fotopoulos was anything but equal. I was getting hurt basically every day. He was hurting me in one way or another. He was either cutting me up with razors or he's, he burned me with an iron once. And he was just constantly terrorizing me. Hunt says the relationship had started with sex and deteriorated quickly after that. She claims that at one point she tried to leave town, but Fotopoulos threatened her. He said that my whole life was over and that I was never gonna go anywhere and I was gonna do exactly what he said. And he was going to end up killing my family and all this stuff. Hunt insists that when it came time to murder 19-year-old drifter Mark Kevin Ramsey, she was totally under Fotopoulos' control. I don't remember doing what was on that tape. I know what's on it, but I don't remember doing it. claims that
that if she had not killed Ramsey, Fatopoulos would have killed her. The same goes, she says, for recruiting Brian Chase into the plot to kill his wife, Lisa. Either he could kill me, or I could do what he said. To David Damore, the man charged with prosecuting her, however, these are the self-serving lies of a killer. He does not dispute Deidre Hunt had a tough life and may even have been abused by Costa Fetopoulos, but he says that does not excuse her crimes. She'll look you in the eye. You'll see these big brown eyes. She'll like literally pull you in as if you should be sympathetic for her. And every time that I start to think that I'm going to let this woman do this to me, I think of the image of that young boy on that tape. And I listen and I hear the sound of his voice scream out in pain. And I watch her hand put a gun to his head and blow his brains out. Is anybody forcing you to do this, making you do it? Faced with that videotape of Kevin Ramsey's murder and her extensive confession to police, Deidre Hunt's attorney convinced her to plead guilty, uh, giving up your right to remain silent, in the hopes the judge would spare her life. Prosecutors argued for the death penalty, but her defense attorney argued that her troubled past and abusive relationship with Fotopoulos mitigated her crimes. The defense put on certain mitigation and psychological testimony, and that opened the door for the state's psychiatrist to testify who had interviewed Deidre, who had uh, evaluated her, and whose findings were that she was, in essence, a cold-blooded killer. Judge James Foxman agreed, and on September 13, 1990, sentenced Deidre Hunt to death. Less than a month later, the focus shifted back to Hunt's alleged co-conspirator, Costa Fotopoulos. He had chosen to plead not guilty and face trial. He also faced the death penalty for the murders of Mark Kevin Ramsey and Brian Chase, and the attempted murder of his wife, Lisa. A successful defense motion moved the trial 50 miles northwest of Daytona Beach to Palatka, Florida. Opening statements began in October 1990. David Damore spoke for the state. This man seated here, Constantinos Petopoulos, killed and murdered two human beings, one by his own hand. Carmen Corrente was appointed to represent Fetopoulos. Heard some pretty bad things about my client. The evidence is not going to show what Mr. DeMore has told you. Carmen Corrente said his client had been framed and that the true mastermind was confessed killer Deidre Hunt. You have to look closely at Deidre Hunt, who was the leader of the group that wanted to take the money and the power that Costa had and give for themselves, and then afterward, they get rid of Costa. The state's case was overwhelming. It included Costa Fetopoulos' wife, Lisa, who remarkably had made a complete recovery after being shot in the head. She testified that in the months leading up to the attempt on her life, it had become clear to her that her husband was being unfaithful. She said she had confronted him and that she wanted a divorce. After that, she said she feared him. Did you ask him not to kill you? Yes. What did he say? He said, why would I do that? And I said, to get my life insurance. Lisa had a policy that Fotopoulos believed would pay $700,000 if she were murdered. In reality, it would have only paid out $200,000. And he said, Oh, I could get more out of you if I stayed with you. And I said, yeah, but I'm not staying with you. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to kill his wife. 
The state brought up several witnesses, mostly indigents from Daytona's boardwalk, who testified that Costa Fotopoulos and Deidre Hunt offered them money to kill Fotopoulos' wife. The state introduced a voice analysis expert, who testified that the voice on the Ramsey murder tape was, in fact, Costa Fotopoulos. Come close, I can see you. Hold on. Fotopoulos' business partner, Tony Calderoni, also testified. He described a conversation he had with Costa soon after the attempted murder of his wife. He just looked at me and smiled, and he said, I told you Greek men never divorced their wives. What kind of smile was it, if you can tell the jury? It looked like a cat eating a canary smile. Calderoni says he was shocked by his friend's callousness. I just looked at him, and I said, you son of a bitch. You did that, didn't you? You killed that kid. Why? And he says, the dead men tell no tales, Tony. I saw a totally different human being than I'd ever seen from the time that I had known him. A totally cold stare, dead stare, no emotion in that face whatsoever, except for maybe happiness. I you know, suspected that my brother-in-law might be behind the state's witnesses came from high society and low. But in a case loaded with remarkable characters, there were two who stood out from the rest, the two alleged co-conspirators. Deidre Hunt and Costa Fitopoulos both took the stand to tell wildly divergent tales. But what was perhaps most intriguing at her sentencing Prosecutors had argued Deidre Hunt was a cold-blooded killer who deserved death. Now, at Costa's trial, they presented her as his victim. In October 1990, the death penalty trial of Costa Fotopoulos was underway. He was charged with the attempted murder of his wife, Lisa Fotopoulos, and the murder of boardwalk denizens Brian Chase and Mark Kevin Ramsey. The lurid case had riveted Florida for months. The sex, the greed, the double cross, and then there was that added thrill of the videotaped murder. The story's two leading characters, Deidre Hunt and Costa Fotopoulos, both had speaking roles in the drama. Though Hunt was already on death row and had nothing to gain from testifying, she agreed to take the stand for the state. She described the man she now said had terrorized her into submission. Discussed Fitopoulos is a psychopath and he needs to be off the street. During her three days on the stand, the state presented Hunt as a victim, fully under Fitopoulos' control. Got up to my ear and he pulled the trigger, or I thought he did. And I knew he was crazy. Some observers found the ploy unseemly, if still perfectly legal. This was a complete turnaround from how the state portrayed Deidre at her sentencing hearing. Within a matter of seven or eight months, she goes from cold-hearted murderess to victim. Uh, the state just whipsawed her, and we all knew it. State Attorney John Tanner denies that his office's change in direction was a cynical strategy. He claims it was the result of a, quote, difference of opinion between himself and the lead prosecutor in Deidre Hunt's case, David Damore. My view was that Costa was a much more dominant person and personality in that relationship, uh, and that he uh, basically had manipulated her. The view between the two prosecutors was different. Genuinely held beliefs, but we didn't agree on that. Two weeks into the trial, Costa Fotopoulos went against the advice of his attorney and chose to testify. He claimed he was being framed, that everyone else was lying. On cross, State Attorney John Tanner challenged him on every point. Did you try to hire anyone to kill your wife? Of course not. You're not accused of being real smart. 
You're no. accused of murder. Yes, I would never have done something like that. Costa was willing to admit to his marital infidelities, but nothing else. You had no regard for that pledge, did you? When Adam was presented with the apple, he took a bite. Why am I so different? Well, there's a major difference. There is no difference. Adam didn't try to kill his wife. Neither did I. He said he was entirely innocent of the murder caught on tape of Mark Kevin Ramsey. You did not seem particularly concerned with fairness when you set about to kill Mark Ramsey, did you? I did not kill Mark Ramsey. And he said the shooting of Brian Chase, who he claimed had broken into his home, was entirely justified. I sat him down because he came in my house and sat my wife. And if you come to my house and shoot my wife, I will shoot you too. During the trial, Costa was, uh, was the consummate con man. Uh, he knew more than he should have about everything. Uh, he always had an answer. Uh, there were no loose ends. He had an explanation for it all. And his answers were, uh, some of them were so far beyond belief that he had outdid himself. On October 25th, 1990, the case went to the jury. They deliberated for just under four hours. Verdict, count one. We, the jury, find the defendant, Constantinus X. Patopoulos, guilty of first degree premeditated murder of Mark Kevin Ramsey, guilty of both first degree premeditated murder and first degree felony murder of Brian L. Chase. Guilty of conspiracy to commit murder in the first degree of Lisa Patopoulos as charged in the indictment. Costa argued at trial that he was being framed for this whole thing. Again, this speaks to Costa's living in a fantasy land. Afterwards, I interviewed the jurors and they, they said there was, we can't, we can't believe that everyone is lying but Costa Fotopoulos. A week later, after a brief sentencing hearing, to no one's surprise, Costa Fotopoulos received the death penalty. In 1995, Deidre Hunt had her guilty verdict and death sentence thrown out on appeal. At a subsequent trial, she was reconvicted, but her sentence was reduced to life without parole. Fotopoulos' ex-wife, Lisa, remarried. She runs her family's businesses on Daytona's boardwalk and is reportedly thriving. She declined a chance to comment in this program, saying she had moved on with her life. Fitopoulos is still on Florida's death row. His case is on appeal. Custa came from a decent family. He came from good parents. He came up not from a broken home. He just turned out just, he was the bad seed that nobody ever knew about. Costa Fitopoulos had everything going for him. He chose to use his abilities and his gifts and his skills to manipulate people to commit unspeakable evil. And because of that, uh, he's gonna die. We want to acknowledge that both the families of murder victims, Brian Chase and Mark Kevin Ramsey, spoke with American Justice. Regrettably, we were not able to include those interviews in the program. Both families wanted to make sure that people knew their losses felt to this day. Kevin Ramsey's mother told us that while Kevin might have been a drifter, he was also a brother and a son and he was loved. Ramsey's sister has named her child Kevin in his memory. I'm Bill Curtis. Join me next time for another episode of American Justice.